Well, can I welcome everyone to the second instalment uh, of our workshop series uh, run by the Carceral um, Policy, Policing and Race uh, project that I lead. Um, last month, um, we had a wonderful event where we were able to explore the colonialities of incarceration uh, in the Global South. Uh, today, we're discussing bordering detention uh, and deportation. Um, the workshop really is a way of expanding uh, what we mean by carcerality, um, because systems of confinement are not just enforced by prison officers um, and the police. Um, they're also enforced by border guards and detention agents too. Uh, and too often the realities uh, of bordering detention and deportation are understood independently um, from how they operate, uh, which is this much broader um, carceral regime. Uh, narrow um, penal centric discussions, uh, which conceptualize incarceration within the confines of criminal justice um, uh, routinely ignore the experiences of racialized populations confined uh, in migrant detention centers, refugee camps, uh, offshore processing centers, and border checkpoints. Uh, and this workshop understands how forms of bordering, detention, and deportation are a, con a constitutive element of mass incarceration um, itself. Um, it, in our analysis, we will ask how do colonial uh, logics um, that have long criminalized, detained, uh, and dehumanized those who are compelled to cross national boundaries, uh, building on a historical analysis of the relationship between convict labor, uh, human transportation, uh, this workshop traces systems uh, of detention and deportation and bordering to its colonial roots and diagnoses its function today to protect uh, colonial acquired wealth and to uphold hierarchies of race, class uh, and gender. We're joined by Professor Shari uh, Akin, who is an Associate Professor uh, uh, at Queen's Law with a cross appointment to cultural studies. Uh, she's an expert on the immigration and refugee law uh, and has appeared before the Supreme Court of Canada in a number of immigration cases. We're also joined by Dr. Enrique Martino, um, who's doctoral teaching and research fellow at the um, Universidad Compulse de Madrid. I've said that very badly, forgive me. My Spanish is appalling. Um, his expertise um, is in social and economic history uh, and particularly the study of exchange, uh, money, labor, and kinship uh, in African history. Uh, and we shall also be joined uh, by Dr. Fiore uh, Bahana, if I said that properly, he's an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Southern California. Um, because Fiore is in Southern California, she will join, but she's not quite with us um, yet, understandably, because it's about 6 a.m. in the morning there. Um, her research focuses on the politics of collective memory amongst the Eritrean diaspora in Northern Italy within the context uh, of the migration crisis. I think that this um, particular aspect uh, that we're looking at is hugely important because sadly, as a consequence of the war um, in Ukraine, the world is facing a massive food shortage problem, uh, a famine problem. It's a problem that will mean that people will cross borders and flee borders, it's very likely over this um, next few years that we're gonna see even more migration. And because we've still got this populism with us um, in Western economies, we're all going to, also going to see a sort of anti-immigrant rhetoric growing. Um, hard to believe uh, it's gonna grow even further, but it's going to be very present in the national discourses of so many of our countries. So I think that this is, really really important each speaker will present thank you for stepping in and 20 going minutes first. before opening up to questions from the audience um, okay so i'm unmuted and you can see the shared powerpoint slide okay perfect uh so good afternoon thanks also to, uh, for, to ollie and david for the invitation um i I didn't know how to title my, my talk and um, in the introduction it was said that the previous session 
what had a lot to do with colonial history. So I suppose I provide a link to the previous session and the current session. Um, because I want to spotlight an episode in colonial imperial history that is very revealing, very interesting. And the, the terms that were created during that debate have really persisted. Uh, that's why I feel like it's always so important to return to this uh, episode. Uh, I think it might be well known. It's the case of Liberia and the League of Nations investigation in the 1930s. Um, to briefly introduce myself, I've been writing about um, the history, especially the colonial history of uh, recruiters, labor contractors, agents, runners, hooks, touts, what are today called smugglers and traffickers. Uh, the agents who uh, organized usually uh, cross-border labor mobilities in the colonial period and in the post-colonial period. And then I've been particularly interested in, their, in, the, in the genealogy and imagery uh, in the colonial period. Um, which is when this stark dichotomy emerges between you know, free regulated movement um, and unfree, problematic, impermissible movement, usually organized by, these, by this new underground of recruiters and, and brokers. Um, and the paradox is that initially these recruiters, they were seen in a very positive light. They were, they were seen as a substitute for, for the usual sources of, of labor in the 19th century, which had been uh, until then for most of the colonial world, the slave trade. Um, so they were welcomed as kind of harbingers of, of kind of, uh, of free labor. Um, and they were seen as legitimate ways to mobilize labor, whether it's through recruiters, through a type of forced labor, tribute, taxation, all these things were seen as kind of modern tools of, a, of, of labor mobilization. Um, but then at some point, uh, colonial states switched. They, um, they started excluding them from the management of labor mobility and designating them as the kind of the new slave traders. Um, and uh, I have a book coming out uh, about this uh, with a particular focus on, on Nigeria and West Africa. Um, so yes, my, I, I wish to focus on the, on the case of Liberia, which is, um, which as you may or may not know, is, became the focus of international attention during the so-called Liberia slavery scandal involving the recruitment of labor um, between Liberia and the Spanish colony of Fernando Po but also uh, the other main employer of labor was the Firestone Company, the US rubber manufacturer that had uh, in 1926 um, uh, negotiated a large land concession with the government of Liberia, a hundred year lease on a million acres about the size of greater London in exchange for a credit of $5 million. Um, and even though Firestone used very much the same recruitment methods that were later denounced, um, they, you know, they had to they had to find figure out a way to present themselves as you know as, as, a, as a as a capitalist benefactor as a as a as an employment provider a kind of philanthropic imperial capitalism capitalism, and contrast themselves with the with the with exploitative kind of colonial exploitation that was then associated with the Spanish who were an easy target because in the British press and the American press, the Spanish had always figured as this kind of semi-civilized colonizer who were always more, more barbaric, more, more exploitative. Um, so the scandal, it, it's interesting to see because the, um, it, it has been researched a lot and uh, by looking at, uh, at, at it in detail again, we can kind of intimate how in the contemporary era, there's also certain scandals and probably will be an increasing number of, uh, especially you know, developing countries outside of the West who get spotlighted, investigated for certain labor conditions, labor recruitment conditions in certain ways. The whole point is the way that the lighting, the way the blame is attributed, the way the causes are, 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 are presumed. Um, and I think Liberia provides a kind of template for this kind of humanitarian neo-imperial um, um, scandal, especially around labor and labor migration. And it's been exhaustively researched, especially by uh, Brandeis professor Ibrahim Sundiata in this book, Brothers and Strangers. Um, and uh, and it, it's interesting to, to note that he, um, I mean, this is this type of archival research where you get, you know, the secret State Department, CIA documents, the private memos and meeting notes, things that in the contemporary period are not clear. But one can imagine that uh, similar things are going on. Um, so the whole Liberia scandal started uh, with the Harvard professor, Raymond Boole, 
he wrote a book called The Native Problem in Africa, published in 1928. Uh, he was director of the Foreign Policy Association and, um, and he had written a book on, on, uh, on labor policies in colonial Africa. And, he's, and he spent particularly uh, an inordinate amount of attention on the case of Liberia. Uh, but he also actually spotlighted the case of Firestone, that in the 1926 deal, in exchange for this $5 million credit, uh, the Liberian government would, would give a 1 million, 1 million acre concession and guarantee the labor. Um, that was part of the deal, because uh, labor recruitment was one of the main difficulties in, in colonial business mobilization, enterprise, etc. Um, so Bull actually points out that, you know, if, if if Firestone plant rubber plantations reach full production, it'll require 400,000 uh, contract workers, which is the entire you know, working age population of Liberia and a population of one and a half million. Um, so you know, in, this, in this concession was bound to give rise to, to exploitation and, and, and scandals. Um, the other issue that Firestone saw was that a lot of the labor in this period in the 1920s was actually being exported uh, from Liberia, not only to Spanish Guinea, also the French Congo, Gabon, the timber concessions, the shipping port, the port areas. A lot of Liberian workers were, were basically the manpower of, of West Africa, especially coastal West Africa. They were recruited in Liberia and worked on one or two year contracts all over the West African coast. Um, so Firestone had to figure out a way to, to limit the emigration of, uh, of Liberians in order to dedicate the entire workforce of Liberia to its big, to its planned uh, rubber concessions. Um, and this was very important for US policy. So there's links you know, between the Firestone and the State Department, et cetera, um, the American State Department, uh, because they're extremely worried about the rubber supplies. Uh, the US manufacturers consumed 75% of the world's rubber uh, for tire manufacturers, Ford, et cetera. And the price had been rising in the 1920s by over 15X. So the price of rubber was 10 cents. It rose to $1.40 in the late 1920s before it collapsed in the World Depression. Uh, so the U.S., one of the prime kind of new imperial policies of, of the U.S. was to independently secure its, uh, its rubber supplies that was controlled by the, by the British and the British Empire, principally in, in Southeast Asia and Malaysia. And indeed, it was an active policy. For example, Churchill, when he was colonial minister, uh, he says here, you know, our principal means of paying back our war debt to the U.S. is to, to sell them rubber from our uh, Malaysian supplies. So the US strategy in Liberia was to actively um, um, figure out a way to uh, secure the labor, have a, you know, a kind of neo-dependent government there in place. Um, so the question was how, how, how best to do that. Um, so seeing, seeing it coming, this is a book by the Harvard professor Boole, uh, kind of scandalizing the labor conditions, not only in Liberia, because it was very common uh, across colonial territories to use, you know, uh, corvée labor, forcefully recruited labor, arbitrary fines and taxations that can only be paid off through enlisting in certain contract labor. So um, this kind of creation of, of, of a free labor market. Um, so in order to preempt um, the potential critique that America would be, would be exposed to, um, they engineered a kind of a kind of modern slavery scandal. Um, so this left side is from Sundiata again, who says, you know, the US is worried that if, if we don't intervene, then eventually the British or French will take over Liberia because of the scandal and the, they'll be given the, uh, the kind of trustee, a UN trustee territory by the League of Nations. So they had to, they had to control the, the scandal. Um, and they did this by unleashing a kind of, uh, it's just, uh, it's this missionary, American missionary, he's, he's unnamed, he's unknown, so it's probably this kind of early OAS or CIA agent um, who denounces to the League of Nations and uh, in a letter to Washington about the apparent condition of slavery in, in Liberia. And the US is quite brazen about this, so they write directly to the Liberian government saying that, you know, you, we have discovered, you know, by chance that you, have a, that you have a system in force that is hardly distinguishable from the organized slave trade. So they actively actually conflate the different types of labor, um, modes of labor, forced labor, slavery, peonage, et cetera, into, um, into a kind of hardly indistinguishable slave trade-like processes. And that's also, that's why, uh, that's why the scandal was then called the slavery scandal, even though it wasn't about slavery, it was about kind of forced, forced labor in the sense of the, that the state taxes people in labor. Um, 
And under pressure, Liberia was forced to agree. And what were they forced to agree to? Obviously, uh, after the League of Nations launched this in investigation, they had to, um, you know, the top seven recommendations of the, of, the, of the League of Nations inquiry and commission was to, you know, open the door to American uh, business interests and, um, and abolish the shipping of labor abroad. So this is a moment when capital, imperial capital wants to become more mobile, but actually in order to do that, it needs to also immobilize labor, which in the case of Liberia was very mobile. Um, so, and they needed this public outcry in order to get these demands from the press to say, oh, you know, the America do something. Liberia is under your type of moral tutelage. It was seen as part of, it was kind of seen as a Latin American Caribbean Monroe doctrine territory that was under an American, um, tutelary or mandate territory so um so they had to do something and and um and so this gave them the pretext in order to uh secure then the labor supplies and the territories for the for the rubber it's not as direct obviously but in general these are the the, the final motives um obviously the process is very indirect so the commission is independent the league of nation appoints three people a liberian politician former president a british colonial explorer uh christie and a, an African-American sociologist from Chicago, Charles Johnson. And they unanimously agree on these recommendations, which you know, are in line with what the US wanted to get out of it. Um, but there is interesting um, tensions between them, especially between uh, Christie, who was the British, uh, the, one of the committee heads, and, and Charles Johnson, the American sociologist. And Sundiata, he notes how Johnson notes that Christie's has a hysterical extreme statement condemning the whole government and calling everything slavery, slave dealing, and slave traffic, et cetera, because this is exactly the discourse that would allow the US to then, uh, through a show of moral force, intervene in, in Liberia, which was an independent republic. Um, and it's interesting to see here what Christie behind the scenes has to say. You know, he's for, for him, he felt that Africans, especially the Liberians and the Liberian elites, were still standing 100 years behind England. So it's a very classical colonial mindset to see what is happening in outside of the West as if it's somehow backwards in time. And this, this idea of positing, you know, developing countries in some other epoch or period then creates this natural association with, okay, if this, if they're a hundred years ago, then naturally what is happening there is a kind of obsolete system that like that we used to have and that we abolished, for example, slavery. So then slavery becomes modern slavery, becomes linked in this kind of uh, in this kind of blurry time timeline um, where contemporary processes of exploitation, for example, the Firestone concessions, the, the cutting edge kind of credit agreements uh, with the New York financiers who were supplying the Firestone, the money to the Liberian government, et cetera, all these contemporary processes are then kind of hidden from view by, by imagining that what's happening here is this kind of revival of, uh, of this 19th century um, process that can only be rectified through uh, to further colonial intervention. Um, and here, this is very clear in, in, a, in a very famous book that also is kind of is the British version of this, of this American Blitz, uh, Blitzkrieg, promotional Blitzkrieg against Liberia, uh, written by Kathleen Simon, the, the wife of John Simon, the famous uh, foreign home office head and chancellor in the 1930s. And here also this dedicating this inordinate amount of uh, attention to Liberia. Uh, where three kind of characteristics that even continue to this day in these type of scandalizing of, uh, of, uh, of ILO or UN or even NGO based kind of um, forced labor scandals or modern slavery scandals. First, the kind of gross exaggeration, you know, she says in Liberia, there's 100 to 500,000 slaves, no one can say it's a, it's a ridiculous number. Um, then there's also the recommendation to have, you know, uh, have in, introduce a strong-minded white uh, lead, white type of, of leader like Lugard, who was the British colonial administrator for Nigeria. Um, and also to create this imaginary that, you know, the conditions of extreme exploitation arise because of this insufficient penetration or administration by imperial power. So she says, you know, oh, it, it's clear that there's so much slavery in Liberia because Liberia is economically backwards. Um, rather than Liberia's reason for suddenly uh, uh, accelerating 
its conditions of exploitation is related to this kind of links to certain American capital than other colonial capital along the West African coast, British, uh, French, Spanish. So it's the same idea of placing it backwards in time. Um, and um, and yeah, I mean, as, as critics already then noted, I mean, this is from the clippings of um, of of the, the Webb Dubois's archive. Um, he was following this case closely, as I'll, as I'll briefly mention. You know, he says this is all a very contemporary process. You know, the United States State Department. Uh, then, after the scandal broke, sent its military and delegates to to Liberia um, in order to abolish slavery, which was the kind of humanitarian imperialism of the day, you know, it's like human rights today. It's like you can invade a country if you're there to abolish slavery and then rehabilitate the economic conditions and make sure that the Liberian government observes the contracts with the Finance Corporation of America, a Firestone Tire Company subsidiary, uh, because the Liberian leaders had actually refused to pay back the loan after the, the collapse of rubber prices. So this intervention, um, uh, you know, was geared to, to, to this. And uh, and the terms of the critiques are also very interesting because it was it was it was uh, it, it was contentious even then. How should we criticize Liberia, the ind only independent Black Republic in Africa, or well, in Atlantic Africa? Uh, who are the who are the benefactors of this critique? How should we couch the critique, etc.? Is it from an, an internal African critique, or is it an external diasporic or colonial critique? Uh, these tensions were already there. And one of the, the two most vocal people who actually were tackling the case were Web Dubois and uh, Namdi Azikewe, um, very prominent later Nigerian president. And in the 1930s, he'd been studying in the US, publishing in Crisis, which is the, the journal that Dubois was uh, editing. Um, and they both wrote very interesting uh, uh, critiques that were actually quite rare. So the rest, most of the critiques were, as we saw before, you know. These, this revival, how, did, how could these new Liberian elites who themselves were descendants of, of slaves in the mid 19th century, how could they revive the slave trade? Uh, they need to get, be got rid of, we need to introduce you know, white administrators to Liberia, et cetera. Um, so Dubois critique is, especially the way that the media focused it to create this kind of scandal as if it's this kind of revelation. Whereas you know, the conditions of exploitation in Liberia were well known because it was hardly indistinguishable from other conditions of exploitation in other colonial territories um, because they used similar tactics to mobilize labor, um, threats of arrest, uh, th uh, excessive levies and fines in order to extract kind of um, labor as repayment to that, um, et cetera. So normal colonial practice, nothing to be scandalized about. That's why it's interesting. Obviously the motive behind here is not the fact that to deny that this existed in Liberia, it's to, focus why certain countries get picked and why certain uh, other countries don't. And this dynamic continues uh, today, obviously. Um, and they were especially critical of, uh, sorry, of a book published by George Schuler, who's a, a notable African-American journalist who was sent to Liberia um, to write this book about this revival of slavery called Slaves Today uh, that denounces the aristocratic elite establishment of Liberia for exploiting its own kind of native population of, of, of its hinterland. Um, and then here it's interesting because here both George Schuler, who's seen as kind of an eventual right wing uh, African American critic, um, and also the extreme left of the of the of, of the Pan-Africanist critiques kind of coincided, for example, George Padmore, he also denounced the Liberian elites uh, because he used a class analysis, so the elites were the 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 culprits here. It doesn't matter if they're black or white; they're just as equal, equally rascally, as he says, equally able to exploit. Um, and I mean, there's a few things that Zikwe, as as Zikwe wrote, that are very interesting. But you know, this is just the idea that. Um, that you know what I've been already saying. I got my analytical ideas from from these articles. You know the, the way Liberia is used as kind of a scapegoat to scapegoat the crimes of all the other crimes that other European colonial powers are doing. So that's the function of the scapegoat. You isolate something that everyone is guilty of and point and point the blame at someone. So the scapegoating mechanism continues to this day. Certain countries, certain figures, for example, recruiters, intermediary figures, etc. And then I think my last slide is just briefly to say how, in the end, there was a once the U.S. managed to depose the the, the president of, of Liberia through a set of coup through a scandal, 
um, and secure what it wanted, which was um, the kind of rubber rubber supplies, and eventually also opening up a, a port, a U.S. Navy port in Monrovia, and um, and this proved indispensable because during World War II, Liberia was the only rubber supplier to the Allies after Japanese took over East Asia. Um, so it was clearly part of the, you know, kind of U.S. imperial strategy, um, but not in any direct way because these scandals then it subsided. You know, they they, they secured the public image of Liberia as its kind of a, a subsidiary state. But when Liberian leaders, if they would, you know, for example, challenge the U.S. terms of, of of the deals or of the new shipping interests in Liberia, or they were granting too many iron mine concessions to other countries, or pushing or refusing to push the moderate line on decolonization in the 1950s and 60s that the US wanted them to, then the US kind of always comes up with these potential kind of labor scandals uh, as a kind of um, stick, as a kind of geopolitical um, stick in order to kind of force countries into place. So um, this is kind of, the, I think, one of the main insights that I just wanted to finish with and highlight the way, obviously, processes of you know incarceration, exploitation, in the different kind of non-Western world are systematic or ever-present, but it's it's what gets picked up and highlighted, especially in the Western press and by international organs that usually have a kind of a design to them, which are diffuse because, you know, it can involve Harvard professors, it can involve some state depart department people who don't really coordinate, but the, but the general motive or end result is kind of clear. Um, so with that, I, I think I'll have my 20 minutes are over and I want to thank all of you again for the invitation and for everyone here. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Enrique, that was um, mm -hmm. fabulous. Thank you so, so much. Uh, can I kick off with two questions, if I may? Um, one is, I, I mean, that was a history that I did not know, but I do know the history of both Liberia and Sierra Leone, which is to many extent a sort of tragic history. And I just wonder um, if, you, if you've been able to sort of tie um, a context where you have a sort of uh, a, a deeply African community with a, um, a sort of former enslaved community that then goes back and obviously here, there's also the, the, the difficult situation of um, African-Americans themselves who are determining that this um, is slavery. It, 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 it lends to this discourse that distinguishes between race and class and race and capital uh, and sort of race experts will understand that sometimes there's a criticism of um, um, North American discourse that doesn't link race to capital. And this seems to be one of those, uh, and labor and therefore class, this seems to be one of those um, uh, arenas where you sort of see that writ large. So I wondered if I might tempt you into that sort of modern um, discussion. Um, and the second, of course, is this um, familiar concern really of um, the way in which one evil is fixed and then replaced with another. Um, and it's a bit like, um, you know, the, uh, abolishing slavery and then replacing it with Jim Crow, because, of course, Jim Crow would have been very present in America at this time when Americans are challenging um, 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 enslavement. I wondered also whether there was a sort of modern context in which you could sort of link to um, where, you know, there's a modern campaign, but actually the wrong that is being re got rid of is being replaced with a new difficult, different sort of perniciousness, really, which mm. is what happened in this very, very clear um, example. So those are my questions. I'll, I think we'll bring in other people's questions before you come back, Enrique, to give you a bit okay, of a breather. Yeah. Um, could others indicate if they've got questions? Um, Ollie. Hi, uh, thanks so much, Enrique. Um, I'm wondering if you could maybe speak about the implications as kind of uh, the historical account for today in terms of maybe your position on things like anti-trafficking narratives 
um, and you know that they are modern slavery today, because obviously it's quite clear at the moment that we have you know a conservative government that's very uh, it pretends to care a lot about trafficking, right, and it cares about modern slavery, um, but uses these narratives to essentially crack down on people who are moving across borders, on vulnerable people, on the people who are being exploited, whether that's the war on drugs with the count lines. Um, or with people crossing borders and sending people to Rwanda somehow uh, dissuade uh, traffickers. And I'm wondering, is that kind of, how does your account uh, lead to those like, implications? And, and what, do you have a position on those kind of um, narratives that really govern our discourse today? Great. And are there any other um, questions for Enrique? Anybody else who wants to come in? Um, Caroline. Hi, Enrique. Um, I, I, I must apologize. I had to be away from the, the session for a few minutes, so you may have covered this. But my question is, do you have any reflections on the impact of um, the, that, the, the slavery on women on, on, in Liberia? What, what, do you have any re gendered reflections? Thank you, Caroline. Okay, I think I'll let you come back in the time mm. available. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I I realized I should have focused more on the on Azikwe's article because actually he resolves some of these um, some of these issues. Okay, so it's interesting. So he he wrote as a low, very lone voice. He was a, a twenty seven year old student at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Zik, uh, uh, the future president of Nigeria. And no one was defending Liberia. It was, you know, the universally hated kind of scapegoat League of Nations, everyone denouncing, everyone condemning. Um, so he wrote, for example, um, in this article, The Defense of Liberia, he actually criticizes the League of Nations and the ILO Convention on Slavery. It's the 1926 convention, which isn't a convention that actually bans slavery. It's a convention that, first of all, says, you know, there's obviously no slave markets anymore. But what it does, it isolates the permissible forms of forced labor. So if you look at the 12 articles, it's a short convention. It's all about how states can legitimately use, uh, for example, penal labor, um, you know, their uh, uh, anti-vagrancy laws, etc., in order to, um, in order to, or comic labor, in order to, you know, force labor, but without being denounced as slavery. Um, so, but for example, when, when Liberia used it, a very, a very much a normal tool of statecraft in conditions of fiscal incapacity and lack of a monetized economy. Um, uh, when, you know, when Liberia uses it, it then suddenly it gets turned to slavery rather than a permissible public service, a type of public taxation, a type of even collective or communal duty. This was the language that was used in the British Empire. Um, and it's unclear whether the Liberian elites also use this kind of paternalist, legitimizing or obscurantist language to legitimize their, their forced labor. Um, but you know, from the outside world, it was seen as just plain revival of, of the slave trade and absolutely it wasn't, it had nothing to do with it, um, which is what the Web Dubois and Zig point out, but they're the very the few people who do. Um, everyone else is content with this new conflation and kind of vague conflation in order to denounce um, the people that need to be denounced in order to intervene, etc. cetera. Um, so the, um, and yes, so the anti-trafficking narrative is in the same vein. That's why I think it's so important to revisit this historical episode because you know whoever you wanna externally intervene with, for example, in 2017, 18, uh, in the case of Libya and the and West African, mostly Nigerian migrants uh, who were there, you know, what, how was it portrayed, portrayed instead of, you know, seeing it in the geopolitical context of the breakdown of, the, of, of Gaddafi's uh, state and the rise of militias, and kind of ransoming, harassment, different types of you know parasitic or exploitative things that could happen in Libya, but also elsewhere. Um, if you frame it as this type of revival of slavery by these Arab, recidivist Arab kind of slave traders who have returned to the 19th century, then it makes this type of moral humanitarian intervention much easier. 
you don't complicate yourself. You can even bomb them if you want to. Um, so it's kind of, um, it's fundamentally this kind of moral, uh, moral gun or that is used selectively. For example, even in the case of Qatar, the only I other ILO investigation apart from Liberia, the Portuguese empire in the 60s that was part of the political pressure for decolonization as well is Qatar a few years ago, you know, the condition of Nepali and South Asian workers there. And you know why why Qatar and not the Emirates or Saudi Arabia? Because Qatar, you know, was seen as a countervailing power with maybe the Al Jazeera different things. So all these political contexts are very important to understand why certain things that highlighted and other people just get a carte blanche. Um, even though everyone's using the same system, everyone is just deploying the labor market and the state tools um, that are seen as legitimate. They're even enshrined as legitimate in all of these ILO conventions. Um, and the, the case of gender is interesting because the Zik also notices this. So the way the new ILO and humanitarian missionaries start conflating, they start conflating, you know, forced labor, state corvées with a pawnship, which is just a normal kind of financial arrangement where instead of amortizing your property or your house, you amortize a person because there's no market in, in property. So it's kind of a normal financial tool that exists everywhere, not only in Africa. Uh, and, you know, it suddenly turned that into the existence of this kind of a slave trade that can be equated with the worst excesses of the 19th century slave trade and even marriage. So the payment of dowry or reverse dowry, which is bride wealth, that suddenly gets converted in the 1920s very actively by missionaries and even international organizations as a type of purchase of people and a continuation of the slave trade. Um, so all these things get conflated into one in, in order to kind of augment this urgency for intervention, for more missionary education, for more financing of imperial initiatives, et cetera. But, you know, there's no, um, the, these, these things, they only get brought up whenever there's a, there's a ne necessary narrative in order to justify some intervention against the public or against uh, a, a treasury. So um, other times they just get forgotten or not mentioned. So it's this, it's this kind of selective use that is very interesting to see because obviously history is complicated and there's constant things um, that are used in order to exploit labor, in order to control mobilities, et cetera. But it's how or why people in cases get, they, they get flashed, they get spotlighted, usually in the interest of states and, and, and international organizations in order to try to control it. Because as I said, the 19th century was part of the rise of this, of creating these narratives in order to control and create regulated uh, mobilities contrasted versus against the opposite. And the opposite of that is the worst, the death, you know, hell, the slavery, et cetera. Um, so this, this kind of moral cosmological narrative is still behind a lot of statecraft and geopolitical construction of an imperial order um, and that uses women as, as uh, or certain cases or traffickers as scapegoats, et cetera. So this has a long history, is my main point. Enrique, thank you so much um, for that presentation and for that extensive analysis. Um, um, really wonderful work. And I'm hugely, hugely grateful to be um, informed <laughs> about it, to go away and mine it now myself. So I'm really, really very grateful. Um, thank you very much. Um, let me hand over to um, um, Shari. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And I think we've sorted out <laughs> the problem. Uh, I think, just a second. Um, maybe not, wait. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> awesome. You guys can see my screen, right? Yeah, it's perfect, Sherry. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, uh, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here today. And, and I think uh, Enrique's talk was a, a really excellent prologue to mine, um, uh, which I've uh, titled From Slavery to Mass Incarceration, The Case of Immigration Detention. Um, you'll note the image, um, it's not actually a detention center, it's actually the end point of, of really where my talk is going, which is detention abolition. Um, and the, both the promise and prospect of that, because while um, I think the, the bulk of my talk is uh, fairly descriptive and an attempt to address um, uh, really the first question that frames the, this workshop series, namely the experience of migrants in detention and the inequalities and structural injustices that such detention reflects and reproduces, 
I think it's very important to not just chronicle the problem, but point to the solution. And so that's the explanation for the image. Um, I am situated in Canada and um, uh, we begin all our talks in Canada um, by acknowledging our own positionality as um, part of an effort to uh, implement uh, an ambitious reconciliation uh, plan with our Indigenous peoples. Um, I feel it's very important to acknowledge my own settler positionality. And I wanna acknowledge the land on which I'm living and working as an uninvited guest in Toronto or Takaronto. Uh, I acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples. It's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to read, research and teach on this land. So just by way of framing this presentation, um, I want to kind of begin with the transatlantic slave trade, um, spanning centuries, some 35,000 slave voyages, somewhere between um, you know, 12 to 15 million people enslaved. Um, and to understand that, uh, that context as uh, an international system that fed a world market. Um, and when we flash forward to today, um, we can think about the conceptual links between slavery and detention um, and understand both as global systems. Right, so today, and, and this data, by the way, is called from the Global Detention Project, which is a, um, uh, an NGO that um, it catalogs uh, the problem of migrant detention around the world. Um, so this map is on their homepage, and I think it's a really excellent graphic presentation of the proliferation of detention, both in the global north and the global south, literally around the world, 1,361 immigration detention centers. Um, and, and these are facilities that are both administrative, ad hoc criminal, and some which are actually unknown. And while the total number of migrants in detention today is actually not known because data from many countries is extremely difficult to come by, we do know that every day, tens of thousands of men, women, and children are detained around the world for reasons related to their immigration status. And um, uh, I think this, this map uh, aptly highlights that. Framing my presentation are essentially three ideas, and I am probably not gonna go into them in, in the meat of my presentation so much as just using them as a framing tool and happy to engage uh, in more depth um, uh, if there's a, discussion or questions about it. So the first idea is that discourses of the vulnerable non-criminal detainee or you know, refugee, refugee women, children, and sort of um, using their cases as a kind of hook for saying we really must do something about this, risk legitimizing incarceration for racialized adult males. So in other words, as soon as we start talking about we must uh, abolish detention for children, or we must abolish detention for women, um, or we must ensure that we have alternatives to detention for these vulnerable groups, we in effect end up legitimizing detention for everybody else. And, and I wanna emphasize that that everybody else predominantly is a racialized population, whether we're talking about uh, the global North or the global South, um, and preponderantly racialized adult males. So I think it's very important to be um, uh, cognizant of the risks of this kind of discourse. And this is related to the second idea, which is that reform air efforts that are predicated on detention avoidance or alternatives to detention are predicated on these very same discourses and risk reinforcing structural injustice and the state's power to deprive both non-citizens and citizens of their liberty. So when we say it's okay to lock up criminals, but it's not okay to lock up vulnerable migrants, 
we're actually reinforcing administrative violence. And I think it's very important to be cognizant of that. And this is really linked to the third idea, which is that detention abolition um, must be predicated on a wider understanding of global detention machinery. And this wider understanding actually aligns with the norms and principles embedded in existing legal frameworks, albeit unevenly and sparingly implemented. And I, I'm gonna sort of point to those instruments towards the end of my presentation. So I wanna, you know, there's a long line of, of scholars um, who've contributed to um, the literature today on detention abolition um, in the context of both criminal justice studies and migration studies, but, but I wanna to point to Ruth Wilson Gilmore's work in particular, and, and this is a popularized a version in which she was quoted in a, um, a, a, a special feature of the New York Times Magazine. Interestingly, it opened the weekend of a workshop that I co-organized at, at my university, bringing together scholars um, uh, from the sort of criminal justice world and the migration studies world. So, Ruth Wilson Gilmore asked this, when people are looking for the relative innocence line in order to show how sad it is that the relatively innocent are being subjected to the forces of state organized violence as though they were criminals, they're missing something that they could see. It isn't that hard. They could be asking whether people who have been criminalized should be subjected to the forces of organized violence, right? So, so that for me is the critical question. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Thailand uh, and Canada as kind of emblematic of a country in the global north and a country in the global south that is a uh, transit location for migrants, um, in contrast to Canada, which tends to be a destination country. So he, this photograph was taken by somebody who was in detention by a detainee a couple of years ago, January 2020. It's a photograph of an immigration detention center in Bangkok, where a facility designed to hold no more than 500 detainees often accommodates up to 1,200. And if you read about what's going on in Thailand, you'll hear accounts from detainees, first person accounts, of having to actually sleep in shifts um, because there's just not enough room on the floor. Um, so, you know, when it's your turn to sleep, you get a little corner of the floor. When it's not, you're standing up. Um, so that's what it looks like in Thailand. Um, we don't know the, the total number of people detained. It's not available. The Global Detention Project doesn't report it, and they have reports on um, all kinds of countries, but we don't know. So we don't know the daily average of people in detention either. Um, although we can guess uh, that there's certainly thousands of people detained in Thailand um, and, and that at any one time, uh, those numbers are quite high. It's interesting to note that um, in terms of the reason for why people are detained in, in um, uh, Thailand, it's enough to be in the country without permission. That's it. It's a, basically, if you're in the country without permission, there's no discretion um, uh, you know, baked in to sort of uh, adjudicate on a case-by-case -case basis, it's lock you up. Um, Thailand is not signatory to the 1951 Refugee Convention, so there's no special recognition for asylum seekers or refugees, and in fact, that's enough in and of itself to get you locked up. There's 22 detention centers uh, around Thailand, and you, know, you think about that, Thailand's geographically not a very large country, it's interesting to compare the number of detention centers in Thailand with the number in a country like Canada, where there's just a handful and a much larger geographical area. Um, in terms of the condition in those centers, severely overcrowded, which I think you had a sense of from the photo, uh, no access to exercise space, inadequate nutrition, children don't go to school, uh, the list goes on. In terms of the length of detention, it varies between three days to 12 years. Refugees and asylum seekers are detained frequently for two years or more. Let's take a look at the picture in Canada. Um, you know, a little under 9,000 people detained in the last reported period, some 326 people in detention as a daily average. So um, presumably a much smaller number than what's in uh, what we would see in Thailand. Important to see this in terms of the length of detention. The average length is just two weeks, just a little shy of two weeks. 
But over the last um, you know, six years, Canada's held more than 300 detainees longer than, uh, than a year. So that's important to note as well. Most detainees end up in these specialized immigration holding centers, but everybody else ends up in jail um, and uh, you know, locked up with um, uh, people who are facing uh, criminal charges or serving uh, criminal sentences. Um, so some 32% uh, of migrants are detained in those um, provincial jails uh, and other facilities. And the vast majority of people in Canada are detained on the basis of flight risk, namely a concern that they're going to go underground if they're released. Um, uh, so it's not that you're in the country without permission per se, um, but I would argue that flight risk is a bit of a proxy for that um, uh, in terms of how the law actually uh, addresses it. I want to acknowledge that there have been reform efforts both in Canada and in Thailand, and I am not going to go through them in detail, but one interesting thing to mention in the Canadian context is that there was an 82% reduction in the population in detention during the peak of um, uh, the pandemic uh, here in Canada, 82%. Uh, interestingly, we see numbers, you know, slowly and steadily um, going back up. But I think the question that the uh, reduction clearly points to is, surely it's not necessary uh, to detain to the extent that Canada is detaining. Uh, Thailand's making some small efforts specifically aimed at vulner the vulnerable, right? So the very problematic discourse that I pointed out to at the beginning, I mean, uh, you know, the government of Thailand has been persuaded to pursue alternatives to tension for children and families and to implement a special screening mechanism for asylum seekers and refugees in its very early stages. But let's follow the money for a moment, uh, going back to sort of the theme of, um, uh, you know, looking at detention machinery as a world system. So back in 2012, Canada gave the Thai government some $7 million to combat human smuggling and crack down on illegal migration, quote unquote. Those funds were used to train police as well as immigration and border patrol officers. But this very same money obviously supported detention and de deportation, at least indirectly, right? Particularly in light of the grounds for detention in Thailand, in the country illegally. So everyone who is in the country illegally is rounded up, detained and deported. Um, and Canada directly contributed to those initiatives as part of a comprehensive interdiction strategy, um, which has been implemented in the region more broadly to prevent irregular migration to destination countries like Canada. Refugees who are fortunate enough to access the assistance of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees join a very long queue as they wait for resettlement, often in detention. And, and I mean, just really important to understand the links, right? Because on the one hand, when um, uh, migrants arrive in the global north, they often find themselves subject to detention. We have to be very careful about detention reforms that end up fueling interdiction. And what that means is that instead of arriving in the global north, um, migrants on the move end up stuck in transit countries and locked up there instead, right? So we can see detention numbers going down in some destination countries in direct correlation with the intensification of these interdiction efforts. Worldwide, we see deaths soaring on dangerous migration routes uh, on both land and sea. We've got the highest number of refugees on record in the world right now. And we're seeing immigration detention in both transit and destination countries on the rise. Reverting now um, in, in the last portion of my talk to the Canadian context, um, I cite a relatively recent report um, by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, which noted that the Canadian government's approach has largely failed to address the deeply embedded structural gaps that disproportionately affect persons with psychosocial disabilities in immigration detention. So in addition to the fact that the population in detention in Canada is um, uh, disproportionately racialized, um, uh, 
people are disproportionately non-white from poor countries in the global south. They are also disproportionately persons with psychosocial disabilities. Um, and uh, the NGOs uh, have cited Canada as perpetuating uh, discriminatory treatment in breach of uh, both Canadian and international human rights law. It's important to understand that Canadian law um, facilitates and reinforces um, uh, the problem. Um, individuals in detention do get a review before an independent adjudicator um, after the first 48 hours, um, after that for seven days, and then every 30 days thereafter. But there's no right of appeal. There's just a limited right of judicial review with leave. Um, it's very hard to get access to um, uh, the federal court in Canada to actually challenge the grounds uh, of one's detention. And part of the reason for that is a Supreme Court of Canada decision dating back decades now, uh, which reinforced this notion that the most fundamental principle of immigration law is that non-citizens don't have an unqualified right to enter or remain. And as a result of this decision, all kinds of structural inequalities have been perpetuated in um, and inscribed in the text of the law in Canada. So while um, you know, other detainees um, who are not being detained on the basis of their migrant status have a you know, um, direct uh, access to bail and a direct access to appeal the merits of any refusal, Non-citizen detainees do not, and it, it really stems back to this um, really foundational decision. And compounding it is a, a slightly more recent decision of our Federal Court of Appeal in the case of Thanabala Singham, which actually said that although you have this right to sequential detention reviews by an independent adjudicator, uh, the previous decisions to detain you have to be considered at all subsequent reviews. And if the adjudicator wants to release you when their colleague the month before didn't, they have to provide clear and compelling reasons for departing from previous decisions. So this dicta actually serves to reinforce the likelihood that if you've been in a detention a long time, you're gonna remain there <laughs> even longer. And just to kind of give you a sense of the highlights or perhaps um, uh, more appropriately lowlights of detention, um, the detention scheme in Canada, there's no statutory limit on the length of immigration detention. Um, the longest period of detention to date in Canada has lasted over 11 years, which involved a man with an apparent mental health condition um, and who was detained only on the basis that his identity could not be established. And I, I have this image of the telephones just because I think it's a very stark reminder that people in detention um, have very limited contact um, uh, with anyone in the, out, in the outside um, uh, world uh, during the time that they're detained and they actually have to pay for phone calls. I want to give a bit of a face to who ends up being detained in Canada. Um, this is one uh, individual, Ibrahim Toure, uh, stateless. He was released in 2018 after spending five and a half years uh, behind bars. And um, uh, it's interesting to note that his case actually was considered by the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. The group found that Mr. Touré's detention was arbitrary in a contravention of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights and requested Canada release Mr. Touré unconditionally and accord him an enforceable right to compensation. He's still waiting. Um, uh, stateless Kashif Ali spent more than seven years in a maximum security jail because Canada was unable to deport him. Uh, he lacked proof of citizenship. He endured beatings from guards, nearly daily lockdowns, and one stretch of solitary confinement that um, uh, lasted 103 days. Formally designated the unknown person, this man was behind bars in a maximum security jail for more than six years, and he refused to participate in 51 detention review hearings, and uh, the Immigration and Refugee Board um, essentially acquiesced to this state of affairs. The case of Alvin Brown is uh, particularly noteworthy, and I, I just want to share uh, what Mr. Brown had to say himself, highlighting uh, the fact that the absence of a statutory limit on detention is really a problem, right? When people are locked up uh, in most systems of law, they're sentenced, and they know how long they're going to be locked up. But in the immigration system, they don't. 
Mr. Brown says, it was horrible. I would have rather been dead than detained, not knowing when I would be released. I spent five years in there and I still can't get over it. The experience is trapped in my mind. His case went to the Federal Court of Appeal. It was ultimately uh, denied um, leave to get to our Supreme Court, um, but the system uh, was basically given a stamp of approval at the Federal Court of Appeal. The immigration de detention regime in, in Canada was constitutionally sound. Here is an image of um, a detention center in Toronto. Uh, it's a remand facility that's overcrowded, understaffed and under-resourced. The number of immigration detainees held in prisons is declining in Canada, but still a significant concern. A new and improved immigration holding center opened in the western part of our country a couple years ago in re uh, response in part to the death of Mexican national Lucia Vega Jimenez um, a number of years before. She was found hanging in a shower stall hours after a contracted security guard falsified room check records. And I want to underscore here the increasing involvement of the private sector in detention machinery. Canada is one of just a handful of states that's legislated mandatory virtually automatic detention for non-citizens in uh, the case of so-called designated foreign nationals in security certificate cases. Um, I want to mention briefly that uh, the case of Monica Vasaga and Suresh, a Tamil refugee subject to a security certificate who spent two and a half years in a facility called the Down the Dawn Jail in downtown Toronto, several weeks on suicide watch, more than 20 years since his release, he continues to experience its devastating effects. Um, his case was brought to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, the commission found that um, uh, Canada owed Mr. Suresh reparations that he was denied equal access to judicial review uh, of his detention. Um, Canada has done nothing in response. And, and just by way of conclusion, I'm mindful that I've probably uh, gone over my 20 minutes. I want to point to the way forward, um, which circles back to uh, the image on the first slide. And in fact, we can go um, way back in the, um, uh, you know, the annals of time to the Magna Carta from 1215, um, which enshrined the principle that no free person shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed, exiled or deprived of his standing in any way. Um, flash forward to uh, the present tense and there's a range of binding international legal instruments, both UN instruments and regional instruments. For those of you in Europe right now, you'll be very familiar with the European Convention here in the Americas, um, our countries have the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. And um, all of these instruments point to the fundamental right to liberty, the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law, and the principle that all persons are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to the equal protection of the law. Clearly these norms are being breached every day with the um, detention machinery that has uh, developed uh, and indeed proliferated since the 1980s. Um, now, I, I will say uh, migrant detention is not new. It wasn't invented in the 1980s, but it was really the 1980s where it became um, a globalized system to the extent that it is today, starting in the North and um, uh, moving uh, right around the world. So uh, I'll end by just um, uh, suggesting that um, uh, there is increasing traction uh, for the idea of detention abolition and of joining forces um, between migration activists and uh, criminal justice activists, um, pointing to the fact that abolition is actually a possibility. And that really is the point of um, cataloging this egregious state of affairs. And uh, I'll stop there. Very much, Shari. That was a wonderful, wonderful and very moving um, presentation. I wondered if you might say something because the, the you know it, it's interesting to be brought up to date with the situation in Canada. Canada is often perceived as a very liberal country. Um, um, now I think Canada hides behind that considerably, but um, with its history. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it's interesting that. Um, the mass incarceration 
uh, of immigrants and those seeking refuge or fleeing um, is so profoundly tolerated in what is perceived to be liberal. It then begs another question, which is, of course, this is because they have breached or the perception is they have breached a rule. Now, we can have a debate about prison abolition and what you do with, say, someone who murders somebody. Uh, but in this context, that breach is that they have sought to claim citizenship in another country. And therefore, it's something about the, 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 the price, the prize of citizenship, particularly in the global north um, as a commodity. Um, in the structure of the world. And I just wondered if you had, a, have you had a perspective on the currency of citizenship, as it were, since the 1980s and why, it fi why we find ourselves in a place where that has become such a precious thing. It's particularly important in an age in which people are fleeing across borders. Kofi Annan talked about problems without passports, which I thought was a very good phrase. And of course, climate change um, and civil war, conflict, terrorism. So many of the things that we're living with in the world, global force drives that very migration to another country that is, and, and this is so de desperately sought of here in Europe, we talk about fortress, fortress Europe. I just wondered if you had an observation on that. Anybody else question for Shari? Yes, indeed. I, I mean, I think David. Charlie, don't come in yet. I'm just going to get other oh. questions before before Fiora because I'm conscious of time. Lucy, I can see Lucy's hand up. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shari, for a brilliant presentation. Um, as you were speaking, I was definitely thinking about some of the connections um, to the UK. Um, so, for example, the the um, your your case of the the gentleman who's deported to Jamaica, for example, we had similar situation here with Priti Patel just two days ago, uh, trying to deport uh, twenty five people uh, to Jamaica, many with no connections uh, <laughs> to to that to that country at all. You know, been in the UK for how many years or decades? Um, and again, uh, your slide on following the money uh, between uh, Canada and uh, Thailand as well, I thought it was really fascinating. Again. Uh, the case of Hackney police um, hosting the Israeli police just a couple of days ago as well. Um, and it's that connection with the UK that, that's the basis of my question. I wondered if you had any reflections on whether there are elements or dynamics or aspects of immigration detention that are specific to settler colonial contexts rather than just the global north. You know, I'm thinking back to your um, land acknowledgement as well. Is there something um, that's very specific to that or do you find that it's generally the um, coloniality of the of the uh, uh, transnational sort of <laughs> con uh, complex of immigration detention that's that's more generalized, um, and also as well speaking of of money and and the really tragic case of um, uh, the woman who I'm sorry I missed her name who hanged herself. Uh, you mentioned that there was a a uh, contracted security guard who falsified the cell checks. What, what um, role do you see racial capitalism and global corporations playing in um, immigration detention? Again, here in the UK, we have large global corporations such as Serco that run our um, immigration removal complexes. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that, but thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Lutz. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and thank you, Sherry, for, for a really um, compelling presentation. Uh, and obviously what I think is rather sad is that, um, you know, it's easy to replace Canada and Thailand with so many other sort of odd couples of this sort uh, where you can, can uh, draw the connection. Um, I've got two points. The first one is on, on the legal analysis. Um, because actually you mentioned the right to liberty and therefore that uh, immigration detention runs sort of counter to these basic principles. And of course, the working group on arbitrary detention has been quite forthright in, in making a number of those findings. But if you look beyond that, uh, there are huge contrasts, for example, in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights with that of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And in a lot of the jurisprudence, actually, um, 
courts and also some human rights bodies that at least have upheld the, the right of states to uh, detain migrants. Uh, so I think it's also there is a problem in, 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 in terms of the interpretation of the law and the discretion given to state uh, and, and as you rightly mentioned to control immigration more broadly and I think uh, detention is seen as an uh, adjunct of that so I think there is a fundamental legal problem there the other major legal problem is obviously that it's very difficult to establish complicity of states for example is funding immigration detention uh, in another country sufficient uh, to be uh, responsible for any violations taking place there, such as Canada in the case of uh, Thailand or Italy in the case of Libya. I think their international law is still quite weak also because of the difficulties of jurisdiction and establishing remedies. But I think the, the, the broader issue, obviously, for a lawyer, all of that becomes hugely frustrating. Therefore, I think what you said is, is, uh, is actually right, that one has to be much more sort of discursive and, and remove sort of uh, the sanitizing discourses that we see all around and say it's, it's simply unacceptable. So I, and I think your point is well made that we, we have a problem if we, if we try to reform the system very gradually without also uh, simultaneously really calling for the outright abolition of, of immigration detention. And I think it's a strong case to I'm make for all the reasons I'm that have been mentioned already. Yes, I'm conscious uh, of time, Lutz, so I, yeah, I, I was, really want to bring Fiori in. That was my last in. sentence, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Shari, can you be brief? Because it would be very good to get a dialogue oh, across absolutely. the three of you at the end, yeah. In fact, I, I, I think all of the interventions were really important and I, I'm not gonna try to answer all of them um, for time reasons. I'm only going to, because I think in the questions there were actually um, uh, pointers uh, to answers um, that we can take up more generally in the Q&A time permitting. But, but I do wanna address the last point about the role of law and uh, the tensions associated with it, because on the one hand, the normative standards uh, point um, to the possibility of abolition because of the way in which liberty is enshrined as a core value. Um, but it's also the case that the jurisprudence, um, as our colleague just pointed out, um, actually does uphold detention regimes and um, makes exceptions for individual deserving cases, right? So the case of Mr. Touré, the case of Mr. Suresh were highlighted as egregious violations um, and, and in both cases called for reparations to the individuals. So it points to, on the one hand, the fact that these legal standards at best achieve incremental <laughs> positive outcomes uh, for individuals, um, but are at the same time reinforcing a system in which um, there's a sort of shared sense of detention as legitimate. And, and that's the tension with using law because it both has possibilities and constraints. My only point in sort of pointing to the standards is to say that we need to actually um, use these tools in more innovative ways um, because just on the face of it, the text of the standards point to the importance of liberty. And so I think we need to kind of turn the system on its head. And, and I think that's what abolition really calls for. So 100% agree that um, there is this inherent tension that one has to be mindful of. And I'm gonna just leave it there. I'm really looking forward to what um, Fiore is going to contribute and, and then having a wider discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Shari. Uh, Fiore, thank you so much. Professor Fiore, thank you so much for joining us and for waking up early in California um, to bring this presentation um, to us. Um, I, I did say at the beginning that I'm sadly not very well. I'm at home with COVID. Um, um, so you'll forgive me that I will listen to your presentation, but I'm going to let um, uh, Ollie DeRose broker uh, the questions and then the conversation, I hope, between you all towards the end. Thank you so much, though. Thank you very much. Thank very you. grateful. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very excited to be here. So this paper that I'll be giving, I'm a, obviously a social anthropologist, so there will be ethnographic examples aplenty. Um, but I'm writing about what I call the paradoxes of humanitarian recognition. 
Um, and so I'm looking at, I work with Eritrean uh, refugee activists in Italy um, around questions of the migration crisis and historical memory. Um, and so I will be giving a paper about how they think about and conceptualize uh, Italy's relationship to Libya and countering these discourses around human smuggling and trafficking. So I began field work in Italy during the summer of 2015. That summer, the picture of Aylan Kurdi, the two-year-old Kurdish Syrian boy whose corpse washed ashore in Turkey, became an iconic image that indexed the tragic and senseless suffering that refugees trying to reach Europe, European shores faced. That photo, alongside the memories associated with the 2013 Lampedusa sinking, framed the migrant crisis not only as a crisis of sovereignty, but as a moral crisis, one which underscored Europe's responsibility towards strangers in a post-colonial world framed by deep and lasting inequities and asymmetries. Yet when I returned in 2017, my interlocutors, Eritrean political activists, described the Mediterranean Sea as closed. They likened the closure as having had the one bridge to refuge that remained taken from them. Moreover, the idea of a closed sea went so against my own understandings of the materiality of water, of its flow and its ability to gradually erode barriers, chip away at rock surfaces, its quality of mutability and effacement, and its role as a conduit in the traffic of persons and things. That I had to ask what they meant by the phrase. Il mare è chiuso, they repeated matter-of-factly, looking visibly annoyed by the naivete they assumed framed my question. I was unaware at that time that the Italian government had recently signed a series of memorandums with the nominal authorities in Libya uh, to intercept and return migrant boats to Libyan detention centers. Migrant official, migration officials with whom I met with described these deals as both painful and necessary. They contended uh, that these deals would ensure that migrants would not fall into the hands of human smuggling and trafficking syndicates. And further, by limiting the number of migrant arrivals, these deals would counter the illiberal populism of leaders like Viktor Orban, who was, according to a well-placed migration official, quote, willing to throw a bomb into the European Union. The subtext of these statements was clear. Keeping migrants out was the only way to ensure the European Union's survival. Eritreans were, unfortunately, one of the many casualties of what uh, has been the EU's main objective of, quote, busting the business model of smuggling. Eritrea is a small country in the Horn of Africa that has been described as one of the fastest depopulating countries. A former Italian colonies, it has consistently ranked as one of the highest per capita producer of refugees for the last two decades. Young people leave Eritrea for several reasons mandatory mass military conscription, conditions of deep economic deprivation, threats of arbitrary detention, disappearance, and political violence, and retributive state violence towards family members. From Eritrea, many young people either flee to Sudan or to Northern Ethiopia. From there, they transit through the Sahara and depart for Italy vis-a-vis -vis Libya. This route, known as the Central Mediterranean route, is the deadliest migrant route in the world. In Libya, Eritreans are subject to a vast kidnap and extortion industry, one which is central to the political economy of both state and non-state actors there and across the wider Mediterranean basin. Detention and kidnap occur in both illicit makeshift encampments and in official government detention centers. The contemporary Libyan state has fragmented into warring militias that profit off an illicit global trade in human beings, oil, and arms following the 2011 NATO intervention. Nevertheless, the country currently serves as an integral partner in Europe's war against migrant smuggling. But before the, 2000, before the NATO intervention, Libya had long been a partner to Europe's mobility regime. In 2007, Silvio Berlusconi, the former prime minister of Italy, and Muammar Gaddafi signed the Friendship Accords. This was to serve as a form of colonial reparations. It was the first public acknowledgement by any Italian head of state of colonial crimes in Africa Orientale Italiana, Libya, Eritrea, Somalia, and during the six year fascist occupation, Ethiopia. Libya would patrol the Mediterranean and push back clandestine boats. Unauthorized migrants would then be held indefinitely in detention centers paid for by Italian funds. In 2011, Eritrean and Somali refugees sued the Italian government 
under the jurisdiction of the European Court for Human Rights and Hirsi Jama and others versus Italy over its return policy to Libya. They won, but their victory was momentary. In September of 2017, the Democratic Party of Italy and stated the memorandum of understanding between Libya and Italy, a series of non-binding legal gentlemen's agreements, which gave aid to Libyan forces to intercept and detain migrant ships. So in this paper, I explore Eritrean activist attempts to draw attention to the conditions within Libyan detention centers, what I uh, called infrastructure, maintaining the fragile edifice of fortress Europe. I focus on some of the debates that Eritrean activists engaged in around highly mediatized events surrounding the migration crisis. I pay close attention to their conceptualizations of mobility, freedom, and their debates on the rule of law. These debates, I argue, are part of a politics of world making, of imagining and enacting a world free of racialized borders, and in the particular of Eritrean sovereignty, one in which the lives of young Eritreans do count. By focusing on their debates, I privilege the centrality of Black speech over the spectacle of Black suffering, foregrounding the analysis of these systems within the kinds of vernacular embodied and experiential knowledge my interlocutors claim as survivors of the Central Mediterranean crossing. While my interlocutors were aware of the structural constraints they fa faced, they were nevertheless, quote, theorizing to save their own lives, striving to explicitly link theory to praxis to affect widespread social and political change. Throughout my fieldwork, Eritreans activists held fast to the belief that visibility and growing awareness of the human rights crisis affecting Eritrea would create material and political change. This stemmed from a successful history marked by international and grassroots lobbying for an independent Eritrean nation, one which marshaled and mobilized experts and activists alike in bolstering claims to Eritrean sovereignty based on Ethiopia's abrogation of international treaties and laws. More broadly, activists utilize the tools common to social movements and human rights campaigns, creating social awareness through letter writing campaigns, engaging in street protests, and acting as witnesses at the European Court for Human Rights. Activists demanded that the cruelty and pervasiveness of violence they encountered at home, in transit, and in countries of settlement needed to be accounted for, as their debates will demonstrate. Further, these attempts and the debates Eritrean activists engaged in regarding the migration crisis draw attention to what I term the paradox of humanitarian recognition which I define as the set of policies and discourses which veil, normalize, and at times abrogate existing humanitarian mechanisms to produce conditions of rightlessness for racialized migrants. So first on a policy level, humanitarian recognition involves the recognition of the possibility of credible claims without the promise of protection. So unlike the label, label economic migrant, which forecloses the possibility of refuge, Humanitarian recognition and its concomitant practice of humanitarian uh, detention nevertheless requires uh, capture and containment for it to function as a humane practice under the auspices of a war against migrant smuggling. So put simply, to protect refugees from unscrupulous smugglers, powerful states block existing channels of movement, cutting off, quote, the supply of vulnerable migrants at its source. And this is often called the whole route perspective under EU uh, um, policy statements. Moreover, the paradoxical nature of humanitarian recognition hinges on the spatializing practices which render certain places, gulags, island prisons, black sites, as sites of rightlessness, sites which critics charge with, with betraying the ethos of the rule of law that are nevertheless constitutive of the liberal democratic order. Nevertheless, humanitarian recognition underscores Eritrean's double vulnerability under a system that collapses care with violence and transforms victims of kidnap into perpetrators of self-inflicted violence through a set of discursive and policy maneuvers that in effect, depend upon the instrumentalization of various forms of social solidarity and kinship. So this next section is called uh, titled the race geographies of mobilities. 
uh, migrant and solidarity activists depict contemporary bordering regimes as moving borders, and that they are mobile assemblages that make, unmake, and remake racialized geographies and cartographies, some of which have deep political ecologies, like that of the Euro-African Mediterranean. Indeed, in the case of the Euro-African Mediterranean, these racialized mobile bordering tech regimes depend upon shifting geopolitical alliances and significant investments from the EU in the material infrastructures, technologies, and training necessary to block migrant movements. While EU authorities are anxious to curtail the movements of Tunisians, Syrians, and other Arabs transiting through Libya, the considerable resources expended to stop Black African migration are remarkable. Muammar Gaddafi's famous threat to, quote, turn Europe Black was a crude and candid statement regarding the anti-Black racism that frames not only European migration policies, but the global migration system more generally. For Eritreans who have been one of the largest groups to transit through the central Mediterranean since the mid-2000s, EU efforts to address the widespread, widespread traffic, kidnap, and extortion of, EU, of Eritrean refugees have coalesced under a series of deals to block their movements. And this includes the Khartoum process, the MOUs, a number of, of, uh, of deals. While 91% of Eritrean asylum claims lodged in the EU were accepted in 2015, growing recognition of the human and political rights crisis fa Eritreans face on the part of European authorities has resulted in more repression rather than less. Put simply, Eritreans represent a threat to an asylum system predicated on, on exceptionalism. The fact that most Eritreans fit within legal parameters of what defines a refugee under the 1951 convention threatens a global asylum system that is increasingly invested in its own destruction. While Eritreans like Syrians have been identified as a particularly vulnerable group, official recognition of their vulnerability has created new forms of exceptionalism aimed at adjudicating who is most vulnerable of an already vulnerable, vulnerableized group. This is illustrated by the fact that Eritreans alongside Syrians are eligible for evacuation from Ethiopia and Lebanon respectively through the humanitarian corridor program. The program selects 500 and 1,000 Syrians for direct evacuation to Italy and provides housing and integration and language services. Unlike the racialized abandonment that the label economic migrant engenders, recognition creates structural evasions on the part of powerful actors who publicly proclaim their support for human rights, but tacitly support policies of containment and detention. So in effect, human rights become spatialized. And if and only if Eritreans reach European shores, can they not only claim rights to asylum, but to claim the right, the status of the human. So Eritreans are targeted by trafficking syndicates because of their wide spanning kin networks in the European Union. Consequently, the kidnap and extortion industry depends upon not only a, a large pool of vulnerable migrants, but those who have the means to pay. Ransoms can reach upwards of 35,000 US dollars. Second, Eritreans and visibility as members of a recently independent African nation, one which is peripheral in the global imagination of nationhood marks their lives as expendable in the eyes of powerful actors, as my interlocutors often explain to me. This was made clear to me during a meeting with Father Mose Zarai, the Eritrean Swiss Catholic priest who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014. During our first meeting over Guinnesses, he relayed an anecdote from a high-level migration meeting in which he was told bluntly that Eritreans were sacrificable. Third, anti-Black racism undergirds the entire global migration system, from the difficulty with which many Africans have in accessing visas, to the significant material investments in curtailing migration from Africa to Europe. Mobility regimes have come to be what scholar uh, Catherine Bestman terms militarized global apartheid. Here, Bestman refers to the novel convergence of military and security technologies and policies of containment and rebordering the world along the uh, Du Bois's the color global color line. So I'm going to have to skip a bit. <laughs> so nevertheless, Eritreans' experience with racialized predation, extortion, and kidnap in Libya should alert scholars to quote 
the local experiences on the African continent, which must be considered as part of the global ideological, cultural, and political economic terrain established and continually updated by the racial logics of European hegemony and white supremacy. And while the incorporation of racially liminal Libyans as Europe's border guards follows racial hierarchies, particular to Italian colonial racial taxonomies, it would be simplistic to understand these deals as bounded by traditional definitions of neocolonialism and their racialized structures of rule. As Lilith Mahmoud writes, this case and others like it show that colonial histories binding individual nations to each other are leveraged in present times to facilitate neoliberal geo and biopolitics that are profoundly transnational in both character and effects. So these sites of indefinite and extra legal detention may be predicated upon neo-colonial colonial relationships, rendering non-white, especially black migrants, as threats to territorial sovereignties, but their logics and spatialities are global in nature. In effect, sites of indefinite detention become modular techniques that travel from place to place, adapting to local political economic conditions and racial hierarchies. Yet the enduring nature of anti-Black racism marks Black migrants, travelers, students, and refugees as objects of preemptive detention and blocking. Moreover, as Ashil Membe has argued, racialized bodies become borders in and of themselves. This is affected through practices of, quote, containment, enclosure, and various forms of encampment, detention, and incarceration, in which knowledge of bodies through the collection of biometric data immobilizes racialized bodies, populations. Further, this is what I argue, this immobilization produces economic value through the kidnap and random, uh, ransom industry through a particular system of extractivism. Rather than exploiting labor, these ex uh, systems exploit the bare necessities to maintain life itself. In sum, while border technologies and practices have changed, they nevertheless reproduce colonial and racial taxonomies rebordering the African continent along, along uh, the colonialist and racialist imaginaries that separate North and white Africa from black Africa. And I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> um, so initially I came to this project because of my interest in collective memory, post-colonial Italy and its racial politics and the legacies of socialist modernities and Eritrea's and Italy's contemporary history. At that time, I described my project to potential interlocutors as a study on collective memory and political imagination. I, want, I told them I wanted to learn more about a little known history, that of Eritrean solidarities with local left-wing groups in Bologna during Italy, Eritrea's 30-year struggle for independence from Ethiopia. So, um, um, so I'm gonna move on to a next section. Um, this next section deals with, um, I called it the cost of making violence visible. Um, it's about, I'll just, I guess, read. Um, Yosef was a young activist who many described as the voice of his generation. I first met him in 2015 when I started preliminary research in Bologna. Even if others were suspicious, Yosef was nevertheless eager to speak to me, even before he had gained the prominence that he has today. He was an actor and student who would often relay his own migration experiences to audiences of young Italians at high schools, universities, and intercultural festivals. His oratorical power was felt whenever he entered a room. Students would often be left in tears as he would explain to them that his own activism was motivated by a desire as much to protect, quote, the rights of refugees as to protect Italians from an encroaching neo-fascism. He balanced these political commitments with the day-to-day -day labor of surviving as an immigrant. He worked during the week at a milk factory located just outside the city limits. I was valuable to the activists I worked with because of my facility with academic English and certain forms of legalese. Yosef enlisted me in translating and mapping the locations of illicit makeshift detention centers in Libya. Refugees trapped there understood that he was an important conduit for information. He would send these details to Doctors Without Borders to provide refugees with food and water and or to the International Organization for Migration, which would send out Libyan security forces to free refugees from these illicit encampments, only for them to be later uh, immobilized in formal detention centers. Families of the disappeared would call him on Facebook Messenger. Listening to the voices of those who had begun to lose all semblance of hope pained me deeply. Nevertheless, translating these testimonies from Tutigrinya to English 
was part of a larger project to document these abuses for a hopeful European Court of Human Rights case. As a refugee and non-citizen, Youssef was putting himself at great risk and he faced political retribution from multiple sources. He had been fired from his previous job at a refugee reception center for his public appearance at an anti-racist demonstration in Rome. He faced death threats from traffickers in Libya. Supporters of the Eritrean regime in exile harassed him and he was publicly accused of being a trafficker himself. Under these difficult circumstances, I saw that his health was fraying. He barely ate and slept. Between university work, his advocacy in Italian schools, and his labor as a witness and survival of multiple detention regimes, Yosef remained surprisingly undaunted. Nevertheless, I worried deeply for him. In December of 2018, I had gone to Yosef's home to conduct our last interview. He shared an apartment with six other college students who came to study from Italy's impoverished South. When we would talk, they would be in the living room watching television. The theme song from Game of Thrones would blare on the television set. These moments of, gave me a sense of a familiar estrangement, a collapse between a life framed by a transnational consumer capitalism that I was familiar with, and one in which the life and death stakes of migration were brought into our space through the very same technologies that permit disinformation on a wide scale. That evening, Yosef remained on the phone for the entirety of our meeting. On other occasions when we would meet, he would be on Facebook recording video messages, encouraging young Eritreans to remain hopeful. During our two hour interview that, that evening, he continued answering call after call from Libyan detention centers, describing torture, beatings, and the complicity of UNHCR officials, whom one caller described as quote, knowing what they're doing to us, the detention guards, knowing that the guards steal the food they bring us and sell it back to us. Libya's detention system is complex and has grown more complex after the 2011 intervention that ousted Gaddafi. Some detention centers are administered by the government of national accord in tandem with the UNHCR. And I apologize for being a little, I'm going to finish this vignette and a concluding paragraph. Um, uh, some others are small houses and makeshift encampments run by human smuggling and trafficking syndicates. Refugees move back and forth between informal encampments, formal detention centers, and a fragmented city in which they are vulnerable to capture by both state and authorities and non-state actors. Often formal detention centers run under the auspices of UNHCR are managed by the same militias many rights organizations cite as being responsible for the litany of abuses migrants face there. Nevertheless, the larger EU discourse around human trafficking, though, evades an important structural fact, one that Yosef clearly understood. If one stays in an official detention center by UNHCR, one is immobilized by the illusory promise of evacuation and resettlement. Initially, official detention centers were created to enable the evacuation of refugees, solely refugees, those who could possibly have a credible claim, for third country resettlement in Rwanda. In 2019, 500 people had been evacu evacuated to Rwanda from the 4,700 in custody and the 52,000 registered by the organization. These evacuations have largely stopped as a result of the pandemic. Currently, there are 597,611 migrants trapped in the country, and this does not include the number of internally displaced Libyans. It was what made it painful to hear Yosef say the word ajoha, a common saying meant to soothe or comfort those who are suffering to the young men, to the two young men who had called that evening. So without smugglers, many of whom are Eritrean refugees themselves, Eritreans would perish in these detention centers. And there's a categorical distinction between smugglers and traffickers within international law and in the experiences of refugees. But the collapse between the two categories and popular and legal discussion in, in Italy, scafisti, has enabled um, Italian authorities to prosecute Eritreans as self-traffickers and their families as enablers and, and accomplices. Quote, busting the business model of trafficking ignores this important social fact. The predatory model of human trafficking functions because it preys upon the strong familial bonds and diaspora. So border regimes in their current iterations routes these families into impossible choices. It criminalizes the very real ways that transnational families use to maintain their bonds. So in effect, the Libyan detention center, the Libyan humanitarian detention complex routes refugees to the subject position victim of human trafficking and their families into accomplices. So I'm just going to read one last concluding paragraph before I move on, before I finish this presentation that has gone 
Um, um, so the ethnographic examples that I presented in this article point to the paradoxes and instabilities within liberal humanist paradigms that undergird human rights campaigning and to the limits and defeats of liberatory projects and politics, um, which I can go into. By looking at the ways in which Eritreans activists actively strategize, critique, and conceptualize humanitarian detention, I look at how experiences of capture and detention can catalyze radical visions of political freedom that extend beyond the boundaries of territorial states. Yet as my work with Yosef demonstrates, the pragmatic and strategic alliances with journalists, rights organizations, and humanitarian agencies that Eritrean activists make elucidate the intricacies in developing political active advocacy for Eritrean refugees. So recently, a group of scholars working on Eritrea and I asked ourselves what it would mean to theorize Eritrea's political culture outside of the discourse of human rights. None of us could come to an answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri. That was, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really evocative illustration of the contemporary political and legal infrastructure of just Europe. Um, and widening this out to the politics of recognition, I thought uh, really interesting, and especially how the politics of, um, or the narrative of anti traffic um, and how that bordering really lies on that. Um, so, thank you so much. And also for the focus, uh, iteration of the lived experience of Eritreans, which, um, yeah, was really fascinating. I think we've got time for, for maybe one question um, before we kind of bring everybody back together. Um, so, if anybody has any questions, uh, in the chat, please uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. Uh, if not, then I, I have one. But there you go, Lutz. Lutz? Yes, uh, hello. Thank you for the, the lecture, Fiore, and uh, or rather presentation, which almost was like a lecture in the end. Um, uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, and I, I've, I've done some work on the Khartoum process, so I'm quite familiar with the dynamics there. So, and, and listening to you, obviously one of the, the bigger issues, which may not apply directly to, to Eritrea, but certainly applies to countries such as Sudan and in the UK context, Rwanda now, I think which we need to address as well, is how corrosive all these deals are. You know, because it's, it, it's almost like you, uh, you um, spread certain uh, highly questionable practices and support them. We heard that uh, about Canada, Italy is doing that, but also regimes such as Sudan, certainly under Al-Bashir with the rapid uh, support forces, but also now Rwanda asking the UK to extradite certain people um, which had previously been protected um, uh, by virtue of human rights concerns. Uh, so I think it's highly corrosive as a system. So I think what you describe is very important when we look at migration directly, but it has obviously also even broader ramifications beyond that in the countries themselves. So I think it makes it terribly difficult for activists also uh, uh, addressing these issues in their own countries where authoritarian regimes can claim that they are acting with the support of supposed human rights champions uh, abroad. Should I wait for another question? Maybe if you answer that, and then we can bring, maybe uh, we can ask any more questions um, off that. Um, thank you, Lutz. I mean, the kind of irony was um, that in 2019, Eritrea was headed, uh, Eritrea became the head of the Khartoum process you know, um, a country in which high level generals have been accused by rights organization as being complicit or um, central to kidnap and smuggling and trafficking. Um, and all of those are actually very different processes mm -hmm. and legal um, have different legal ramifications. And, but um, it's, it, is, it gives new life to these authoritarian regimes. Um, and you're absolutely right with the corrosive um, the corrosiveness of these um, of uh, these policies, but what's also fascinating is that you know a memorandum of you know I've looked at the deal with Rwanda. So uh, elsewhere, I've written about how my interlocutors understand themselves as laboratory mice. Mm. So I, I wrote an article that's under review um, in which they talk about these border regimes, right? 
Um, and they say, well, we're the mice that they experiment on to see if the medicine works. It, and if it just doesn't kill, then they apply it to everyone. And it was a really fascinating take because it's, uh, Eritrean refugees were also subject to these voluntary uh, self-deportations to Rwanda uh, from Israel. And an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, is what Italy had developed with Libya, which are these kind of loose arrangements that forestall, foreclose any kind of legal accountability. But at the same time, and what the UK signed with uh, Rwanda was also an MOU. So there's these are kind of new legal instruments that are developing, um, you know, to further not just not the abrogation of the rule of law, because international human rights law has always been a bit tenuous and very and difficult to um, to um, uphold international treaties, etc. So you could just break the treaty. But why engage in an MOU, right, which isn't about breaking the law outright or just ignoring human rights law, but it, it is something, it, it is, I think, a way in which a public facing transcript will say, well, this is still the rule of law, right? The rule of law is an important kind of um, emic category for European uh, policy officials. They have to believe themselves in the, rightness of what they're doing by framing it within the discourse of the rule of law. And so these legal mechanisms allow them to say, okay, this is technically the rule of law um, because this evades kind of, a, it's not a treaty. It doesn't obviously break um, these conventions. We're not doing it publicly, but in effect, in practice, that's exactly what's happening. Um, so in, in the end, it allows the rule of law to remain as a cultural ideal without it remaining as a practicable legal standard um, as that's my take as a kind of political and legal anthropologist. Thanks so much. I think we've got one, one more question um, for Paolo and then maybe we'll just try and really quickly bring it all together because I'd uh, love to hear from any other questions for the broader group. Paolo? Hi, Kiora. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful paper and I really look forward to, to reading it in full. My question stems from my own experience researching um, asylum reception in Italy. And uh, I, I was actually fascinated by the way in which we evoked the world making projects that emerge from the imaginations and, and practices and activities of, of the Eritrean activists that you that you spoke to and encountered. But uh, which, I mean, I found some resonance to, uh, with those of, well, they were not activists, but actually asylum seekers in, in reception centers. But perhaps due to their um, condition, they also had quite um, specific and in fact, very situated uh, concerns that it, they were also very much concerned with place making practices. And so I wanted to uh, hear from you a bit more on that, whether you encountered that, how do you uh, relate those place making practices with the with the broader world making ones that you described so well. Thank you. Um, so, a lot for Eritrean for the Eritrean diaspora, Bologna as a city is incredibly important. Um, so, you know, um, first uh, from 1974. So. When Eritrea, the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, Eritrea was an Italian colony, as I'd explained, um, complicated history, but at some point it was federated to Ethiopia, then the Federation, uh, Haile Selassie annexed the territory, and from 1961 to 1991, Eritrean guerrillas fought a war against successive Ethiopian regimes, and uh, a third of the population was dispersed in exile. So the Eritrean guerrillas realized that these people were really important to state building from abroad. And so they mobilized refugees and kind of made, made Eritreans in exile, right? So this, there was a process through which these exile festivals and the largest one uh, and most symbolically important was in Bologna. Um, from 1974 to 1991, successive communist mayors supported the Eritrean guerrillas. They came to Bologna. Um, many of them studied at the university. They would study surgery and then return back to the field as guerrilla doctors. So, but this is a largely unknown history for many Italians. But so, so the two generations of Eritreans there, 
one generation Eritrean called generational nationalism. These are the, the typologies given by Tricia Reddick or Hepner, the people who left in response to the guerrilla war, to the war with Ethiopia. Their, their subjectivities are very much so aligned with the Eritrean regime and um, in freighted ways, uh, complicated ways. And then this newer generation of refugees, uh, generation asylum, you know, these are the people who have had to live with the consequences of a uh, of a left, uh, a radical left project that, you know, turned authoritarian, totalitarian in nature. So there was a lot of conflict between who represented what it meant to be Eritrean, but specifically who represented what it meant to be Eritrean in Bologna. So there was, I also wrote about this, but the, the uh, recent generation of refugees actually was able to um, have a memorial for the Lampedusa sinking um, sponsored by the city. And so they lobbied the city government to have a memorial for the sinking um, in which the majority of people who died were Eritrean. Um, and this created a lot of political conflicts within the community between those who support the regime and those who um, are against the regime. But it was an interesting moment in which this was a, an act of claims making to the space of the, of the city, right? And they mobilized this kind of anti-fascist imaginary and the idea that if, as refugees, of course, we fit into a kind of, we face a resurgent fascism. And so we also lay claim to the city and to this anti-fascist history, right? Our movements are, um, um, and our history specifically as Eritreans and our relationships to the left. So yeah, I'll stop please uh but thank you for the question <laughs> thank you so much Rui. um really great i know i don't want to keep you all uh past past four um that you're all incredibly busy but i wanted to um open just an opportunity if, if sharon Eureka wanted to add a thing to the discussion um and maybe there's no pressure um but maybe if we could very quickly um potentially ask for a more broad question which is it may be a bit reductive to do this after these fantastic things, but I think it's always good to end in kind of what do we do and how do we move forward? And I kind of think it touches on some of all of you said, but um, maybe we could be more explicit, which is if we are governed by systems of colonial capitalism that, that structure these forms of bordering and tension, you know, should we be fighting for a world without borders? Um, because, you know, I think it's easier for abolitionists uh, in the kind of criminal justice setting, uh, to, to think of a world without prisons, um, you know, should our should that extend it to a world without borders? Um, if we are talking about bordering as a of class reality itself, um, I know that we have two minutes left, and that's literally impossible to answer. But if anybody wanted to uh, share their preliminary thoughts, then great. But um, no worries if not. Um, maybe I'll just jump in because I I think that's an absolutely critical question, Ali. Um, and I, I think where I'm sitting in Canada, um, it, it's very important to understand the consequences of some of these arguments. So in as much as I consider myself a no borders activist, I also understand the extent to which that discourse can intensify and reinforce detention machinery. Because as we, you know, deconstruct the borders, um, we still have states and this system of state which perpetuates administrative violence in a highly um, uh, unequal world um, will tend to have recourse to detention. You know, as the walls come down um, around the periphery, they go up inside. And so I think we have to think very critically through that paradox. Um, uh, and it's something that I think there's not enough attention to. So I don't have an answer, <laughs> but I think you've asked the fundamental question um, when it comes to ultimately questions about citizenship, which um, you know was uh, raised earlier and I didn't have a chance to address. So thank you for the question. Thanks, Sherry. Yeah, Ricky? I'll just say, uh, Thank you also, and briefly, the fact that the perspective that I was trying to bring about the labor market, it's confusing because, you know, the critique cannot be about labor exploitation, which is the usual critique. It's rather about the labor market management. So even detention, deportation is part of this imperial process of labor market management. And the map that Sher Sherry showed it shows just the intense gradients of geopolitics. Where are the centers? Where are they created? Who, who finances it? So here you get a sense of the real geopolitics.
that is way beyond a open market or, or labor market. Um, and the fact that this revival, the, the way the language that he used to police this is this revival of the of, of the old language, you know, trafficking, even Fiore used a bit of this, you know, syndicates, these kind of old fashioned terms for criminal networks. Um, and this is what irked Dubois the most about why this language, what it represented, it represented the death knell of Pan-Africanism, which was a kind of a borderless kind of a, a dream. It put a spanner in it because it, it just showed that, uh, you know, that, this, that the past kind of continues to put a spanner into plans of kind of a global commonwealth, a certain Pan-Africanist commonwealth, et cetera. So um, yeah, I think this is the, the historical lingers a lot here. Thanks. Um, I think, I mean, I, I think that there's a quite a significant distinction for, um, for how it is, I mean, how borders act within the cultural imaginaries of even refugees themselves. So in my work, I see that those who arrived earlier will say, well, we arrived legally, we're the rightful refugees, we're not breaking the law. Um, or they'll have um, these kind of um, poison solidarities with recent refugees um, and second generation uh, um, immigrants, specifically around the question of, of the morality of border, of, of who crosses a border and how, how and why. So part of the understanding of a world without borders is not only one in which these walls would go down, but it would be also the cultural meanings associated with bordering that impact that even uh, structure the intra-communal terms of of relationality and sociality that I, I have been thinking through. Thank you so much. Even um, all of you on that question, I've learned so much uh, and had no idea that there was so nuanced even for that kind of topic. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think I just want to thank the uh, all of our speakers once more. Um, Enrique, that was really great historical account um, you gave, uh, for explaining how these more frameworks um, of anti-trafficking and slavery are used and co-opted, um, you know, to uphold imperial power, as you say. Um, and uh, it is also you know, nauseating to hear those narratives from nations who profit uh, from slavery the most. So I think your historical account is really, really important. Um, Shari, thanks so much for uh, a really powerful edition of the centrality of detention because I think you know we like to think of detention sometimes as a subsidiary to this kind of system of incarceration when really it's a central part of it um, and particularly how you know the, the reformist calls for more humane systems um, of detention end up just legitimizing uh, the system of detention and violence itself and Fury um, thanks so much combining like a really focused uh, illustration of Eritreans in, in Europe um, with such a comprehensive analysis of tension, um, you know, and the way it upholds regimes of mobility, uh, particularly at the end about uh, the body being a site of detention itself, I think is really fascinating. Um, so yeah, thank you so much uh, for joining us um, and for all the strange time zones we had to mix together. Uh, so yeah, really, really grateful. Um, we do have a third workshop soon um, to look at that. It will be on policing in the global south. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much and um, hopefully see you all for the next one. Really grateful for you to join us. Thanks again. Cheers. Thank Have you. a nice day. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everybody.